In this video, we'll review the basics of electronic oscillator integrated circuits. Electronic oscillator circuits can be broadly categorized as either tuned oscillators or nonlinear oscillators. Tuned oscillators are those which rely on a resonance circuit connected in such a manner that oscillations are sustained, similar to a tuning fork that's continually being struck. Nonlinear oscillators, on the other hand, rely on feedback to sustain oscillations and a nonlinear element in the feedback loop to limit the amplitude of those oscillations. Relaxation and ring oscillators provide very compact integrated circuits and provide a very wide range of frequencies uh, at which they can oscillate. So they're quite popular for integrated circuit implementations. Among tuned oscillators, LC oscillators can provide high performance, that is very good spectral purity, and can also be integrated into a pretty small area, but have limited tuning range and do require more area than nonlinear oscillators due to the need for an inductor to produce resonance. Crystal oscillators are also very common and important circuits on integrated circuits because they can provide outstanding spectral purity and frequency accuracy. But unfortunately, they can't be completely integrated because they do need an off-chip crystal to determine the oscillating frequency. In this video, we'll focus on two of the most common integrated circuit oscillators, the ring oscillator and the LC oscillator. Now, if we seek to make a fully integrated oscillator circuit, there can be no off-chip components that are high accuracy and determining the oscillation frequency. All the components on an integrated circuit have varying parameters. They vary with process, voltage, and temperature variations. So therefore, the frequency of fully integrated oscillator circuits are always gonna vary in the presence of process, voltage, and temperature variations. There's no analog to the band gap voltage reference for oscillating frequency. The band gap reference circuit relied on the band gap of silicon, which is an absolute constant but there's no such quantity that can be used to fix the frequency of a fully integrated oscillator circuit. When a precise oscillation frequency is required, therefore, you have to rely on an off-chip component, such as a crystal that has been accurately trimmed to achieve a specific resonant frequency, or we can use a fully integrated oscillator circuit, but provide a tuning input. Shown here is the most common case where the tuning control knob is a control voltage labeled V control here. This control input is used to control the oscillating frequency produced by the oscillator. The resulting circuit is called a voltage controlled oscillator or VCO for short. In order to provide a constant stable oscillating frequency in the VCO, we have to dynamically tune it to track a stable off-chip reference shown here as a crystal. So in practice, a feedback loop is created so that the output of the VCO is observed and forced to match the frequency and in some cases, the phase of oscillations determined by an off-chip crystal. The resulting feedback loop is called a phase lock loop. In a phase lock loop, if process voltage or temperature variations cause the VCO output phase or frequency to shift, V control is dynamically readjusted to restore the desired oscillating frequency and phase. Now you might say, if you've got access to an off-chip crystal anyway, why not just make a crystal oscillator operating at the desired frequency? There's a couple of reasons why we still need phase lock loops or PLLs for short. One is that we'd like to generate a frequency that's much higher than the resonant frequency of cheaply available crystals. Another is that we may require on our circuit more than one oscillating frequency, but we don't want to have more than one crystal connected to the chip. In such cases, we can use more than one phase lock loop. We'll see later how phase lock loops can be designed to generate an output frequency that's an integer multiple of the reference frequency provided by a crystal. In fact, 
more advanced phase lock, cir lock loop circuits can be used to generate output frequencies that are not integer multiples of the reference frequency as well. This gives us complete freedom to create any output frequency we want from a single fixed crystal reference. The most inexpensive crystal off-chip components have resonant frequencies in the range of 10 to perhaps hundreds of megahertz. Now let's consider the ring oscillator circuit. Ring oscillators are compact and robust oscillators. They can be modified to provide a voltage control input, thereby creating a voltage controlled oscillator. And they're very often used in practice to produce clocks at over a very wide range of frequencies. Shown here is a very simple five stage ring oscillator circuit. It's comprised simply of five CMOS logic inverters connected in series with the output of the last connected to the input of the first. To understand its operation, let's begin by imagining that the input to the far left inverter V1 is at a low logic level, as shown here. And the inverter will therefore produce a high logic level at V2 and a low logic level at V3 and so on. And that's exactly what we see in the picture at the bottom. Now note that a low logic level at V5 should produce a high logic level at V1, but we've already said that V1 is at a low logic level. So therefore, V1 will toggle and become a high logic level, as shown here. And once that happens, it'll cause V2 to toggle and become low, causing V3 to go high, and so on. Now, each inverter output will take some time to toggle. If we imagine that the delay time of each inverter is TD, then it takes some time for this toggling to propagate all the way from V1 to V5 and then back to V1. The length of time that takes is clearly given by 5 times and uh, TD. In this case, there are 5 stages in the ring oscillator, n equals 5. And so therefore you see each node in the ring toggles every n times td or 5 td. The periodic waveforms that arise, therefore, have a half period given by the n buffer delays. And so the period of oscillation is therefore going to be 2 times n, the number of stages, times td. Hence, the clock frequency is the inverse of that, 1 over 2n td. A neat property of the ring oscillator is that it not only produces not, not just one oscillating waveform, but in fact n oscillating waveforms. In this case, there are five oscillating waveforms, one at the output of each inverter. Moreover, assuming the inverters are well matched, these five clock waveforms have uniformly spaced phases. So you've essentially got clock phases evenly spread over the full range of clock phases one to pi radians. This can be very useful in some applications. To better understand the operation of a ring oscillator, it's worth thinking about the case where n equals one. After all, if you're interested in producing a high frequency ring oscillator, it makes sense to use the fewest possible stages in the ring. We said that the oscillation frequency equals one over two n td, so if we want to maximize the oscillation frequency, it might make sense to use the smallest possible n. Even looking at the schematic here, you might say if a low logic level arises at the oscillator input, that should give rise to a high logic level td seconds later, which then in turn shows up at the oscillator input and then causes the output to toggle back again another td seconds later, and so on and so forth, producing 
oscillations at a frequency of one over two TD. But that intuition would be false. In fact, if you took a simple CMOS inverter and connected it in feedback as shown here with a supply voltage VDD, whether in you did this in simulation or in the lab, you would observe that the only node in this circuit would settle somewhere around half of VDD, and it would remain there stably. And that's because the circuit is a single pole, stable negative feedback system with a small signal model shown in figure B down here. In this small signal model, it's clear that the node V1 could simply sit at a small signal value of zero volts around its operating point, which is somewhere around VDD over two. You might wonder why the same doesn't happen with say three stages in the ring or five as shown in the last slide. After all, it's true that if we apply or initialize the voltage at any one of these nodes to be around VDD over two, but set it to be precisely the voltage that gives rise to the same voltage at the output of the inverter, then in principle, that looks like an operating point that works. The truth is it is an operating point that works, but it's an unstable operating point because in this case, it's a negative feedback loop with three poles. And it can be shown that under most reasonable conditions, that is whenever the CMOS inverter at this operating point exhibits a reasonable gain, that the loop has no phase margin and is in fact unstable. The unstable system therefore will spontaneously start oscillating as soon as any thermal noise or any effect causes any of these nodes to depart from this perfect value around VDD over two. And once the oscillations start, because the feedback loop is unstable, they will grow in amplitude until eventually the inverters saturate and we see our clock waveforms. But the key point there is that there's three poles in this feedback system, which give rise to a maximum phase shift of 270 degrees, which is enough to cause the instability. Whereas in the sting single stage ring, there's only 90 degrees of phase shift because there's only one node. We could also consider what happens when n is an even number like two shown here. This in fact is a positive feedback system and is therefore also unstable. We can't for any period of time maintain the operating point where VDD over two is the voltage at all of these nodes. Because again, as soon as any thermal noise or anything causes the voltage to leave that operating point, the positive feedback around the loop will cause the inverters to saturate. But the difference with an even number of stages is that instead of oscillating, the system will settle to a stable operating point eventually with each inverter saturated there's two possible states where this circuit can settle this 101 state or the 010 state each of these is a st stable operating point and the circuit could sit there forever this is an example of a bistable circuit a circuit that has two stable operating points and that's why we use this circuit all the time. In fact, this is one of the most common CMOS circuits there is. It's a latch or a basic memory element. But any ring with an even number of stages like this is a bistable circuit and would exhibit this property and would not sustain oscillations. Thus for proper operation, a ring oscillator requires N at least equal to three and moreover, n must be an odd number to ensure that there's 
negative feedback around the loop at low frequencies. So let's consider an n stage ring where n is odd and where each stage can be modeled by a single time constant response having a pole at 1 over R0C and having a DC gain given by capital GM times RO. Now the response of each of these stages is therefore GMRO at DC and that single time constant shows up as a pole here. In fact, uh, as it's drawn here, there's a negative sign for the response of each stage, of course. But if we cast n of these stages in series into our model for a negative feedback system, we would see that it has a loop gain L shown here because the negative sign is part of the model of negative feedback we assume. So it's simply this term here raised to the nth power. So we can quickly sketch a Bode plot here. Now, clearly L has three poles, all coincident at this frequency, one over R zero C. There'd be a DC gain up here. That's G M R O all to the power of N. And then at that corner frequency, we start to roll off at minus 20 times n dB per decade. The phase response, on the other hand, would start out at zero degrees and would hit a value of minus n times 45 degrees at the pole frequency. and would asymptotically approach minus n times 90 degrees at high frequencies. So um, clearly if n is equal to five, seven or higher, then even at the pole frequency, we would already have a phase shift below minus 180. So in such cases where n equals five, seven or higher, um, the system is guaranteed to be unstable for any DC gain greater than one. There's the possibility that with n equals three, there's a, there's a sort of remote possibility that the, the loop can actually be stable because when n equals three, we'll actually have a phase shift of minus 135 degrees here and so minus 180 will arise you know somewhere around here so again if somehow this crossover this unity gain crossover frequency arrives before this phase shift reaches minus 180 um, then it is possible that with n equals three the ring could be stable and would not oscillate but that would require the gain GM times RO to be very, very small. So you can leave it to you as an exercise to find out what's the minimum gain required in a three-stage ring to ensure oscillations, adopting this single time constant model for each stage. But it's a very modest gain. In practice, certainly an inverter would have a small signal gain exceeding that threshold. So uh, a three-stage ring oscillator is very, very likely to robustly oscillate. But from this analysis, you can also see why, why clearly with n equals one, it would fail to oscillate. With n equals one, the maximum phase shift of L would simply be minus 90 degrees and the feedback loop would be unconditionally stable. Now this need to have an odd number of stages in the ring can be 
limiting and frustrating at times. But we can get around this requirement quite easily in the case where we have fully differential delay stages in the ring. Rather than a simple CMOS inverter, we can make use of some kind of differential single time constant stage here. And there's a variety of simple delay circuits that could be used to realize a fully differential delay. As is the case with all analog integrated circuits, there's plenty of good reasons to use fully differential circuits anyway. Notably, in the case of voltage controlled oscillators, they provide good power supply noise immunity. So when we've got fully differential delay stages anyway, then you can in fact have a ring with an even number of stages as shown here for n equals four. The trick is that with n equals four, you've got plenty of phase shift through the four stages of the ring to ensure oscillations. You just have to make sure that the feedback is negative and not positive. With a fully differential ring, the negative feedback can be ensured just by crossing over the outputs before feeding them back to the input. In a sense, you get a gain of minus one for free that way. And you can ensure that there's negative feedback around the loop. And yet with four stages, you clearly have enough phase shift to ensure oscillations. A nice thing about using an even number of stages is that by taking these opposing points in the ring, you can get clock waveforms that are 90 degrees apart. Quadrature clocks can be very useful in a variety of applications, but you don't get them when n is an odd number. Here's a simple example of a fully differential controllable delay buffer circuit. You see that power supply rejection is provided by the tail current source 2IB above the differential pair. Now for this simple differential pair circuit, assuming there's some load capacitance connected to each side of the output, CL, it can be shown that with a sinusoidal input applied to V in, the delay through the stage is proportional to CL over the input differential pair transconductance GM, that is the small signal GM of Q1 and Q2. Now, since GM is determined by the bias current flowing through it, then the delay through this stage is controlled by the bias current IB, which in turn is controlled by the gate voltage applied to the current source transistor. So that voltage serves as the input to this delay circuit. And when you have several of these delay circuits connected in a ring, that becomes the VCO's control voltage. At the same time, you need to have a second control voltage adjusting the NMOS current sources that are serving as active loads to ensure that the common mode at the output doesn't stray too far from its good operating point. Obviously, many other delay circuits are possible, but this is just an example so you can see how a control voltage can be applied to uh, regulate the output, the delay time through this circuit. In this example and many others, the relationship between the control voltage input and the delay time is not linear. So don't expect it to be a linear relationship between V control and the oscillating frequency of the VCO. But as always, as long as the control voltage is limited over a very narrow range, then we can linearize the nonlinear relationship and perform linear analysis of the PLL that the VCO sits in. Next, let's consider this simple example of a tuned oscillator, a so-called LC oscillator. It's formed by connecting an inductor and capacitor in parallel, as shown here. Now, if you consider the equivalent half circuit, you'll note that L and C are not quite connected in parallel. But since the supply voltage is a small signal ground, then with respect to the small signal equivalent, then L and C do appear in parallel, both connected between the output nodes and ground. 
Now, in the small signal analysis, let's say that let's label the output nodes V1. So this is an equivalent half circuit. V1 is really V out plus or minus. Now, due to the cross connection between the MOS transistors, you'll see that the gate applied at each uh, node, the gate voltage applied to the transistor connected at each node is assumed to be negative of the output voltage on that side. So this assumes that the, out, the circuit's perfectly symmetric. And so therefore it goes in a fully differential fashion. So in this case, the small signal transconductance of the MOSFET here is drawing a current proportional to the voltage across it, except the constant of proportionality is negative GM. So essentially, that looks just like a resistor. A resistor also draws a current proportional to the voltage across it, except usually the current flows into the higher voltage terminal of the resistor. But in this case, the current's flowing in the opposite direction. So it looks just like a resistor with a negative value of negative one over GM. Now, you've also got positive values of small signal resistance appearing between the output nodes and small signal ground. For example, even if there's no load connected, there's at the very least the RDS of the transistors in active mode. By the way, you're assured that when turned on, the transistors are likely to be in active mode because, um, well, I should say at their operating point, they're in active mode because the gates at DC are connected to VDD and so are their drains. So in active mode, you've got a fairly high value of RDS connected here. And so the intuition is that you have to ensure the negative one over GM resistance is more than enough to offset the positive RO resistance comprised of at least RDS. If it is, you know, you've got the parallel combination of these two resistances. If the negative one over GM resistance overcomes the RDS, then you've basically overcome all the resistive losses in the circuit and you're left with just an LC resonant circuit, which as we know, can sustain oscillations. And those oscillations will arise at the resonant frequency one over two pi root LC. So that would be the case if the negative and positive resistances cancel out perfectly, then you would just have sustained oscillations at a constant amplitude at the output. Now in the practical case, you'd want to ensure one over GM is actually larger than RO or larger than RDS, let's say, uh, if RO just equals RDS. So that would give you, first of all, a bit of margin to ensure that subject to some variations, you would still have um, net negative resistance there. And moreover, the net negative resistance would ensure that at startup, oscillations will grow from starting from near nothing and eventually arising in a large enough output swing that the transistors enter triode at the bottom uh, end of the output swing. When the transistors enter triode, the transconductance GM of the NMOS transistor will decrease.
and then will no longer be enough to overcome the resistive losses. So that kind of serves as a saturation point for the oscillator. So in summary, the circuit's pretty easy to design in the sense that you just choose the values of L and C to obtain the oscillation frequency you desire. And then you've got to introduce the cross-coupled transistors in such a way that the negative 1 over GM, the transistors at their operating point, is more than enough to overcome any resistive losses between the output nodes and ground. Again, many variations on this oscillator circuit are possible. You can use PMOS transistors instead of or in addition to the NMOS transistors. Um, you can introduce tail current sources to improve um, immunity of the circuit to ground noise. Um, but the operating principle is generally the same. An active device, a transistor, is introduced whose transconductance can overcome the resistive losses in the LC tank. Since the inductor in part determines the oscillating frequency of the VCO, it's a critical component in LC oscillators. Implementation of inductors on integrated circuits is pretty simple, but is a little bit problematic. Essentially, we just use metal layers to make a coil, and that coil has some inductance, induces some magnetic flux and alternating current flows through it, gives us an inductance. We can introduce the metal coil on one layer of metal. We can use vias to connect it to a second layer of metal and introduce additional coils uh, on stack layers of metal to try and increase the inductance. The main challenges are, first of all, that to realize reasonable values of inductance that will give us uh, reasonable oscillating frequencies, it takes quite a bit of area. This coil has to be relatively large, certainly larger than the transistors that are required to give us the negative one over GM. Second challenge is that realizing an inductance this way is highly non-ideal. So specifically, the wiring required to create the coil has some sheet resistance associated with it. So the inductance we get comes with some series resistance, RS. This is an additional source of loss in the LC tank in addition to the transistor RDS that needs to be overcome. Uh, as a result, the larger the RDS in the inductance, the larger the GM required in the transistors, which in turn will imply more thermal noise introduced by the transistors, and um, that makes for a noisier oscillator. Second non-ideality introduced by these large inductors are simply capacitances to ground. Since imagine this spiral is quite large, several hundreds of micrometers, for example, on a side, that introduces a lot of capacitance to any surrounding metal. And even if there is none, and generally you try and avoid surrounding metal around an inductor to avoid unwanted parasitics, you still end up with quite a significant amount of capacitance to ground. So inductors are usually modeled using some kind of equivalent circuit like this. This is a relatively simple model where all of the series inductance associated with the inductor is um, all the series resistance is lumped into a single component rs in reality obviously that resistance is distributed along the entire spiral so this is an approximate model likewise the parasitic capacitances to ground are lumped into two equivalents even though in reality they appear scattered and distributed all along the inductor coil so more complicated more accurate models can be obtained by chopping up the inductor into many smaller inductors in series and thereby distributing the resistances and capacitances all along the line. Now, 
this equivalent model has a specific impedance at the oscillating frequency of the VCO. And so what can be done is the series resistance can be transformed into an equivalent parallel resistance at that operating frequency. That would be the equivalent parallel resistance that gives rise to the exact same impedance at that particular oscillating frequency. And in doing so, you can then lump this inductor losses together with the RDS of the transistor and then see what GM needs to be to overcome that. Now, recognizing that the inductor is realized just by a metal coil, you can see that it's not straightforward to make L tunable. There are some attempts to do this uh, using switches that short out various components of the inductance or connect other inductors uh, in parallel or in series. But generally, the inductors are more difficult to make programmable. So when it comes to the LC tank in an LC oscillator, usually the inductor is realized as a fixed inductance like this. But the capacitance is made variable. There's many ways to realize variable capacitances on an integrated circuit, you can simply have a bank of parallel capacitances that are switched between ground and just open circuited. Um, you could, there are also ways to make varactors out of MOS capacitors. One way or another, LC oscillators are made into VCOs typically by controlling the value of capacitance. Remember that the oscillation frequency depends to first order analysis just on the values of L and C and not on any bias currents flowing. It should be noted that the variable capacitance typically will also have series and or parallel resistances associated with it that further contribute to loss in the LC tank that resistor RO that has to be overcome by the negative one over GM of the active devices.